Section 1. You will hear a conversation in an international airport between a newly arrived student, Jenny Lee, and an agent at the lost luggage counter. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Notice that an example has been done for you. This time only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. OK, who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. The time now is 12 o'clock, so letter C has been circled. Now let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will hear the recording once only. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. OK. Who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket, please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes. The connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally Singapore Airport is very efficient. Now, I need you to fill in these forms. Your name? Jenny Lee. Address? I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like 583. No, it's 533 East 67th Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um, 9301-4262. So you came in on Qantas Flight 392. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cathay Pacific 900 or something. Oh yes, it says here, CX912. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Right. Now, I need a description of the luggage. How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. OK. It's a big bag, like this one. Rectangular. Not hard shell, but soft covered. And it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. OK, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at 17.50. That's 10 to 6 this evening. 
You can pick it up then. Ten to six? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course, I almost forgot. Will the bag come here, to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key plus your ticket with a baggage claim number on it. Oh, OK. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of Section 1. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a recorded message about buying tickets from a booking agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Thank you for calling ATS Advanced Ticketing System, the call system for all your entertainment needs. Our automated telephone service is designed to answer your questions quickly and easily. The ATS office in the Regency Theatre is open Monday to Thursdays from 10am to 5pm and on Friday and Saturday till 8pm. For online bookings and detailed program listings, check our website at www.atsticks.com. That's spelled A T S T I X. Please listen to the choices available. You may press your choice as soon as you hear it to get more information. For sporting events, including the Western International Tennis Classic, press 1. For the Formula 1 Grand Prix, press 2. For classical music, including the upcoming Philharmonic Orchestra series, press 3. For theatre and dance, press 4. For other inquiries, please hold the line. Before the recorded message continues, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, as the message continues, answer questions 16 to 20. Ticket prices for the Formula One Grand Prix on the 10th until the 14th of March are as follows. General admission, Thursday, $27. Concession, $10. Friday, $37. Concession, $15. Saturday, $55. Concession, $35. Sunday, $70. Concession, $65. Concession rates apply to children under 14 and to students 
seniors and pensioners on presentation of a valid card. Grandstand seating. Four day tickets covering the six main grandstands cost $299. However, pit straight tickets are $350 and seats at the chicane cost $450 each. Children under three are admitted free to the general admissions area and children under 14 are eligible for concession prices. Gates open at 8am Thursday and Friday and 7.30 Saturday and Sunday. Events begin at 9 o'clock. Alcohol, ice boxes, cans, bottles and animals are not allowed on site. There are no refunds or exchanges. On each ticket, a $2.50 booking fee applies. To make a booking, you must have a valid credit card. To listen again, press 1. To make a booking or to talk to a ticket agent, press 2. Your call is in our queue. You can expect to wait about three minutes. That is the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organising an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially like the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. OK, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. 
It is held over four nights during study break, Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well, we do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences, so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect, and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film, or a $20 pass for the whole event. All 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year, except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall, we had a good turnout. More than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about. The financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the programme. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion. Something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer to a group of civil engineering students on the reed bed system for sewage treatment. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about what is now called the reed bed sewage treatment system. This system uses naturally occurring reeds to treat domestic and industrial waste. It's an environmentally friendly alternative to normal systems. You all know what reeds are like, don't you? Those tall plants with hollow stems that grow in wet places, like marshes, for example. Here's how the system works. First of all, an artificial marsh is created. To do this, holes are dug about one metre deep and usually rectangular in shape. They are then lined with clay or plastic and the liner is covered with gravel. After that, a system of tubing is laid, with holes in it, and more gravel is added to cover that. Finally, reeds are planted in the bed. The sewage is brought to settling tanks. From there, it is distributed to the roots of the reeds through the tubing. Note that the waste material enters the beds underground, and remains underground. The reeds conduct oxygen very efficiently through their stems to the roots system. Here, bacteria work to reduce the waste material to basic elements. What comes out of the artificial marsh is water that has been cleaned through a natural process. The purified water leaves the reed bed through a simple outflow pipe. The water that comes out has to be tested. Sometimes it's held in a pond until it evaporates or soaks into the ground. Sometimes, after testing, the water is discharged directly into streams and rivers. Before the talk continues, with questions from the students, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 35 to 40. The reed bed system originated in Germany in the 1970s and installations have been built in a number of countries throughout the world. To give you an idea of the size and appearance of a reed bed installation, an area of 3 by 5 metres approximately would be adequate for a single house. It would look like a pond overgrown with reeds. There are cities with 150,000 people in Germany whose entire sewage treatment requirements are served by reed bed installations which extend for 10 to 20 hectares. There are two wonderful environmental advantages. First of all, reed bed systems are natural composters. As time passes, high-grade soil builds up in the beds. The soil can be removed and used for agricultural purposes. Soil produced from waste containing heavy metals would of course have to be tested and the toxic material removed by chemical processes. An additional advantage is that the reed bed can function exactly as a marsh providing a healthy natural home or habitat for waterfowl and other birds, insects, reptiles and mammals. But there are practical advantages to a reed bed system over existing sewage treatment plants as well. At all levels, the cost is lower than for normal systems. Labour costs are a fraction of the costs of a conventional system. Typically, a large-scale reed bed installation will cost 10% less than a mechanical system. 
They require little maintenance, and unlike mechanical systems, the efficiency of reed beds increases over time. But before we go any further, you must have some questions. Maybe this sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. If these systems have so many benefits, why aren't they more popular? Why don't we see them everywhere? As I said, the technology is now almost forty years old. Demonstration projects of all types have been built and monitored, and are slowly convincing regulators of the advantages of the system. But you have to understand that regulating authorities are by nature conservative and resist change. Typically, there's a lot of opposition to these systems by manufacturers and by everyone involved in maintaining the conventional systems. Reed bed systems require fewer staff to operate, so there would be a decline in the workforce. Therefore, unions would resist the change as well. What happens to reed beds in winter? Does the efficiency decrease? The above ground part of the plants die back in cold weather, but the roots remain alive and active, and the system continues to work just as effectively in winter. As soon as the weather warms up, new reeds appear and grow quickly. Is there a problem with mosquitoes in these ponds? Well, they're not exactly ponds with standing water. The beds look more like a field covered with long grass. The soil is moist, but not like a swamp, so there would be no more mosquitoes than in any other field. Remember, the effluent enters the beds underground and remains underground. Okay, let's get into some of the technical details now, and I'll answer questions as they come up. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.